Hello everyone, I'm Dan Philgreen, and this is Shell Point Today for Monday, February the 2nd. On today's show, we'll get a preview of the upcoming Academy class on the history of the Middle East. And we'll hear from Dr. Trevor Elmquist about the condition called dry eye. But first, we want to remind you that if you plan to enter a quilt in this year's quilt show, the deadline for registration is today. The blue registration forms are available at either service desk. Our favorite history professor, Adrian Kerr, will be back tomorrow for yet another Academy class. If you have been to one of his classes before, you know that this man is always full of fascinating information and insights. He sat down with Terry Kolaff to give us a preview. Hi everyone, I'm here with Professor Adrian Kerr. We're talking about a series on the Middle East every Tuesday in February. Adrian, it's always great to see you. And it's always a pleasure to be invited. Thank you, Terry. Well, the Middle East is something that you have led us through in a variety of ways over the years with your great historical background there. And now we're going to come to present times, which doesn't seem any less confusing than it ever did to any of us. So thank you for helping us start at the beginning and try to make sense of it one more time. And look at the end, your last session about what's going on today in the Middle East. But right now, let's talk about how you're going to begin the Middle East. It says the Middle East history to present times. Why do you begin where you begin? Um, many people just accept that the Mesopotamians um, around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers um, developed their cultures, uh, ultimately leading to Babylon. Many people just accept that the Nile folk uh, developed the Egyptian culture, and likewise the Indus civilization folk, and now what is Pakistan, just appeared. And of course, that isn't the case. Uh, around about 2600 BC, all these civilizations did just wake up one day and start building. Uh -huh. uh, there is a prehistory before even that, and the first um, episode will be explaining where the peoples came from that set up these civilizations, what was common amongst them, uh, what was unique amongst them, and how much interaction. And it's really interesting to know that around about 2800 BC, um, the people were traveling from Afghanistan to Egypt, bringing uh, lapis lazuli, the blue stone. It's the only source of that blue stone in the Middle East. Um, at that time. So they were not even building pyramids at that time, but they were trading with the people of the Tigris and Euphrates. They were moving, there were, there were camel trains and donkey trains back and forth between a very primitive Egypt into Afghanistan to get this blue lapis lazuli. So it shows you that even before great structures appeared in the Middle East, there was a, there was a trade network um, and communication, and of course later became um, the ability to write and put down thoughts, which we have some still surviving. So we are going to start at the very beginning um, in that area. We're going to go through the various um, processes in the area that made the change and how much of it, if any, has changed dramatically um, to now. Many people look at the, um, let's say, Europe and um, the Middle East and say, my goodness, isn't it uh, full of turmoil compared to the Native Americans who had a fairly steady, stable uh, um, culture for the same period of time, 14,000 years. And uh, many people have investigated what's, what's so different about the Middle East, that you have these enormous um, changes of people, these great wars, famines, floods. It seems just to be um, everything that you can think of bad and good happens in the Middle East. Um, and a book was recently published which looked at this and said that really out of our European American culture, um, our drive for um, new technology, uh, advancement in, in agriculture, um, political concepts, democracy, etc., industrialization. Those didn't just happen. They didn't happen in North America. Mm -hmm. It came from this interaction between peoples. You had the uh, various uh, folk in the Middle East being attacked by the, the Turks coming in from the east. Um, you had the Arabs expanding into the Mediterranean. We had the Romans, the post-Romans, the Byzantine people who all intermingled. And it was never steady state. Even up to 1914, the First World War, the Ottoman Empire controlled most of the Middle East. But of course, they were hated by the local Arabs. And that's why they joined in with the Allies to try and kick the Arabs and the Germans 
turns out. And then, of course, after that, we look into the modern phase, which is the last 60 years, as to how do you then reassemble the post-Ottoman world in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we haven't done very, the, haven't done very well in that area. <laughs> no. And has it been imposed upon them rather than coming from within, how they're going to reassemble? Um, looking at modern times, yes, you can go back to um, the First World War when the great allies carved up the um, Ottoman Empire, which has shrunk to Turkey, which it is today. And so Iraq, Jordan, um, and uh, Syria, Lebanon, was f basically had the opportunity to be either become independent states, but they weren't states in the way that we look at them today. They were owned by the Ottoman Empire. They had governors. So there was not a, let's take for Iraq, for instance. Iraq wasn't a state under the authority of the Ottomans for 200 years. It was just a province, an Arab group of people. And so suddenly, in 1918 onwards, uh, the West imposed boundaries, geographical boundaries, and right. said, this area is going to be Iraq. Um, and the capital is going to be Baghdad. And it's going to be some form of um, uh, um, king is going to run that place. So you see a situation after the First World War where the West imposed artificial geographical boundaries on the places that we know today, which mm -hmm. is Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and of course then Israel came into the mix, and Egypt as well. So all of these countries, um, which we now recognize as independent countries, weren't so under the Ottoman Empire. And so we've now superimposed on um, a group of Shia Sunni folk in Iraq saying, right, this is your country and, you, and we'd like you to run it in a democratic fashion. And of course, the dictator takes over. We get rid of the dictator and we hope that the democratic process will then bring a, a balanced, neutral leader. When that hasn't happened, he was um, biased in one side or the other. So the other side then react. And now you see, for instance, uh, Iraq split in two or, in fact, three because the Kurds are like a piece of action too. Sure. And then we see the spread of the problems in Syria into northern Iraq, and so it goes on. And we'll see by the time we go through session four, the last Tuesday in February, that groups like ISIS see a niche yeah. that they can yeah. grow in. And we'll talk about how ISIS went from uh, a, a tiny little guerrilla movement in Syria to now hoping to control half of Syria and half of Iraq and what the West are doing to try and uh, help other people bring, bring that to stability. Mm -hmm. Well, it's fascinating, and we really appreciate how you're going to show us that you know, history really makes a difference, the knowledge of history, the understanding. I think people at the end of this will understand that um, how we got ourselves into this situation. Um, and so it's mysterious to many people. Why is there so much turmoil in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, particularly section, session four, we'll see exactly what the, uh, the key factors were that led to this very difficult, some people say insoluble issue in the Middle East. I have to give a positive ending by saying that Afghanistan could have gone the same way. And if you'd asked me six months ago what would be the chances of a, f a moderately peaceful um, Afghanistan after the new election of president, I would have not been as optimistic as I see today, where the president and the prime minister have um, peace has broken out between them. They're jointly ruling. Um, the people, by and large, are following the democratic process. The Taliban, of course, are very active with United States air support. Um, both the um, people and the government um, are determined to try and hang on to some form of democracy in Afghanistan, which is really quite encouraging when we look at what happened to Iraq, which is not quite the same. It's encouraging and hopeful, uh, maybe to learn from Afghanistan and maybe fast forward a little bit in some of these other countries to what really did work. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Adrian. I know you'll want to be there every Tuesday in February. If you have to miss one, I'm sorry, but try, because you will get the big picture of the history of the Middle East to present times with Professor Adrian Kerr. Sadly, we recently had to say goodbye to our dear colleague, Mary Franklin, but her legacy lives on in some interviews she conducted that we will be sharing with you from time to time until they become obsolete. She talked with Dr. Trevor Elmquist about a Health Connections presentation coming up this Friday, where he will be discussing the uncomfortable annoyance of dry eye. I'm Mary Franklin, and I'm here today with a doctor that I feel needs no introduction here at Shell Point because 
everybody knows, Dr. Elmquist. He has been at Shell Point as one of our specialty doctors for many years, and he's going to be presenting once again in the Health Connections, and the topic is dry eye syndrome, which, Dr. Elmquist, a little bit of an oxymoron because dry eye syndrome has nothing to do with dryness. Well, it has a lot to do with dryness, but the the, one of the common symptoms that we see are wet eyes. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of difficult to explain to the patient who comes in saying, I'm tearing, I'm tearing, what's wrong? And I want to talk about dry eyes. That's the first thing I think of. It's very common to have dry eyes that irritate your eyes, and then there's this reflex mm -hmm. tearing to wash your eyes off. Your brain says, something's on my eyes, drying out mm -hmm. the skin or rubbing on the skin. So your lacrimal gland secretes tears and trying to flush it out. That's a natural response. And you do run into folks that always do kind of constantly look like they're crying. They shouldn't be scared to go to a doctor's appointment because there are many options of treatment, right? And Correct. Most of what we do, and we'll talk about this, sort of a step ladder approach. We'll start with basic, simple, conservative things first mm -hmm. and then move up to higher medications or even possibly surgery. But Okay. Well, one of the things that I appreciate and our residents appreciate about you is you are very much of an educator. You don't feel, you're not the doctor that I have all the information and I'm just going to tell you what to do. You educate your patients. I do. And it's true with our cataract class mm -hmm. before surgery, everybody has to attend my class. It's a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. Right. And they like it and they educate me about their needs so I can do a better job in surgery when I know what I'm trying to achieve for this particular patient. Right, it's nice, you really, you make a, a decision with the patient and I, I respect that from you. Thanks. Well, this is going to be a great presentation. I'm Mary Franklin along with Dr. Almquist. Make it a happy and healthy day. Now let's cover all of Monday's happenings, Academy News, menus, and Village Church Connections. Right after this word from David Howenstein with a preview of his radio show on TV, Listening to the Words. For this week's encore performance of Listening to the Words, I've chosen my 100th program, which was first aired the week of March 4th, 2013. It includes a piece titled Falling in Love and another called Choosing Gifts for Women, written by humorist Dave Barry. That's followed by a piece titled Women's Revenge. Also listen for several poems by members of the Shell Point Poetry Group. Also an excerpt from an interview of Mr. Fred Rogers. Those who've moved to Shell Point in the last two years will be surprised by this program. It'll be new to them, while others will enjoy remembering some good stories when listening to this week's repeat program. Tune in to this 30-minute show at the top or bottom of each hour any day this week on Shell Point Channel 12. This is your reader host, David Howenstein, thanking you for listening to the words. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the happening segment of Shell Point TV. I'm Bev Chandley, and this is Caitlin Van Scoy, and we're going to go over what's happening here at Shell Point today. Our activities start out this morning at 8 o'clock with men's match play doubles tennis at the Woodlands Tennis Courts. 8 o'clock is also the time the mobile mammography van will be at the Village Church from 8 to 5 o'clock. Virtual bowling will be played in the Resident Activity Center at 8.45. And then we have a 9.15 billiards group at the Resident Activity Center. Our last 9.15 activity is pottery with instruction available in the pottery studio. That's down in the tunnel on the island. Men's match play doubles tennis is at 10 o'clock. Also at 10 o'clock, we have the Suzy Q boat heading to Matanzas on the bay for lunch. Sign up is required at the greeter's desk at the island. 10.15, the Parkinson's Enrichment Group will be at the community room of King's Crown. And at 10.30, the Disciple Men's Bible Study Group will be in the game room at the Woodlands. The table tennis playing clinic will be at 10.45 in the Tarpon Room. And a Health Connections class starts at 11.30 this one is Agility and Flexibility for Everyday Life, Session B. That's currently full, and it, it's held in the health, health Club. Here's Caitlin for your afternoon activities. Thank you, Bev. We start the afternoon off with Mahjong at 12 p.m. in the Sable Room of the Woodlands. 
and 1.15 is the time for advanced table tennis in the tarpon room on the island. Samba the card game will be played at 1.15 in the Resident Activity Center. And tone chimes will be in the Osprey Room at 1.15. From 1.30 to 3.30 today, the Model Train Room will be open for complimentary tours. At 2 o'clock, the BDI Beat Club will be meeting in the Oak Room at the Woodlands. And the Shell Point Singers have rehearsal at 3.15 in the Choir Room of the Village Church. At 3.30, we have a Health Connections class, Aqua Agility and Conditioning. That's in the LifeQuest Aquatic Center. Come out for pickleball at 4 o'clock. That'll be on the pickleball courts at, on the island. 6.30 is the time for Duplicate Bridge in the game room at the Woodlands. Our last activity for the day is 7 p.m. Square Dancing in the Health Club, and that's currently full. Well, those are all the exciting activities we have for today. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Hello, I'm Terry Colath with your Academy information from Monday, the 2nd of February. At 9 o'clock, How to Photograph People continues in the photo studio on the island. And at 9.15, we start Skype Basics in the Computer Teaching Center on the island, and sign up is required. At 10.15, we have an iPhones Contacts app class and the Manatee Room on the Island, please sign up at either service desk. At 10.30, Anatomy of Words continues in the Oak Room of the Woodlands, and it's a new class every time with everyone welcome. At 1.15, we have better communication with email beginning in the Computer Teaching Center on the Island. Please sign up for that course. And at 1.15, the story of New England whaling, the second session, will take place in the Social Center on the island, and all are welcome. I'd like to tell you about some new classes coming tomorrow. Writing your memoirs on the computer with two Lakewood ladies, Lucille Peterson and Marty Gibson. The History of the Middle East to Present Time, Session 1, with Professor Adrian Kerr. And Apple iPad Apps, 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 with Bruce Findlay of Sundial. Menus for Monday, February the 2nd. In the Crystal Room, the platter is sherry mushroom chicken with quinoa and broccoli. For dinner, it's old home cooking night for $11.95. The soup is vegetable beef. In the Island Cafe on Monday, for lunch, it's a Philly cheese steak panini with chips for $7.25. At dinner, it's fiesta pork chop with yellow rice and fresh fruit for $8.25. And on Monday, the Palm Grill is closed. All menus are available 24 hours a day at shellpoint.net. Welcome to Village Church Connections. I'm David Pavey, an assistant pastor. A few years ago, when ministering in England, I had the pleasure of driving the distinguished author, Jill Briscoe, to give a lecture at the London School of Theology. In the course of her presentation, she told the following simple story, which touched my heart. As a board member of World Relief, Jill visited Zagreb in Croatia during the Kosovo War with several American women. They were to meet refugee women, many of whom had lost their husbands and boyfriends in the Balkan War. Whatever do we say to them, the Americans asked Jill. Just say, we had to come, advised Jill. In fear and trepidation over their inadequacy to help, the American women were soon surrounded by the refugee women. What are the Americans saying, Jill asked her interpreter. They're just saying, we had to come. And what are the refugee women saying, asked Jill. Responded the interpreter, they're just saying, you came. You came. Y you didn't just send a book or a CD or money or a care package. You came. Jill calls this the Ministry of Presence. How important is the Ministry of Presence? You probably can't do much to change the circumstances for somebody else, but your very presence is a comfort and a blessing to them. It's a sign that you care. I love that little story in the Bible where David was hiding from mad King Saul. Saul was trying to assassinate him. But Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David in Horish and helped him to find strength in God. 
The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And then we read, Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horish. The ministry of presence, a friend to help in time of need. One day, one of my Albanian friends in England had to be confined to a mental hospital. He was suffering from schizophrenia. I visited him regularly, feeling totally helpless to change the situation. After being ushered through two locked doors, I would talk with him, tell him about his family, and pray with him. Thank you for coming, he would say. You are like Jesus to me. It was the ministry of presence. In 2002, my brother died of a malignant melanoma. He was two years my junior. We had grown up together and were close. Though his malady had rendered him a paraplegic, he died suddenly of massive internal bleeding. So it was a shock. At the time, I called my colleague Brian, a remarkable Christian leader who lived a mile or two away. He was sympathetic and said, would you like me to come over? No thanks, I said, I'll be fine. Then neighbor Tom dropped in, probably to borrow a garden tool again. Tom was a big bipolar alcoholic, a rough fellow indeed. Ignoring the purpose of his visit, I blurted out, Tom, my brother just died. Tom threw his arms around me, gave me a big bear hug, and just held me for a long time. Sometime later, I had lunch with Brian. We recalled that day. I said, Brian, in retrospect, you should have come. He agreed. I needed the ministry of presence, though too masculine to admit it at the time. Three years after my brother passed away, my father died at the age of 94. At that time, we were ministering to refugees from the Balkans who had made their way to England. As soon as news of our bereavement reached the immigrant community, Nancy and I found ourselves with a room full of Albanians who had just come to exercise the Ministry of Presence. They just sat there, quietly, none of them able to speak much English. Admittedly, this was a cultural pattern of behavior for them, but still, it was a special comfort to see this demonstration of care, of love, of respect. It was the ministry of presence. Ray Baki, the expert on urban evangelism, talks about the war in Vietnam. It couldn't be won by American pilots based in Guam and flying over the country in their air-conditioned cockpits, he said. It could only be won in hand-to-hand -hand combat on the ground, which is why America didn't win. We can't live in antiseptic isolation and expect to bless our community. We need to live amongst our neighbors as salt and light and exercise the ministry of presence when needed. Some of us are naturally more task-oriented than people-oriented, but all of us need to keep before us the importance of the personal touch. I've been in situations where, as a pastor, I was only esteemed to be working when I was in my office. Now, that kind of work is important, and I do my fair share of it, but it's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. In our busyness, let's keep in view the importance of the ministry of presence. Who in your orbit needs to feel your presence today? And thank you for tuning in to Village Church Connections. We're glad you joined us for today's show. Tune in tomorrow when we'll meet our new resort services and wellness manager, Heather Batty. And we'll hear from Director of Project Development, Bob Southern, about some new four-legged neighbors at Shell Point. Until then, this is Shell Point Today for Monday, February the 2nd. I'm Dan Philgreen, and from all of us here at Shell Point TV, we hope you have a great day, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.